Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Cheryl Hilton and I am the Dean of the New York University College of Global Public Health. Our college is proud to welcome you to NYU's campus here in Washington, D.C. for this important and timely discussion on curbing gun violence in the Trump era, a practical look at balancing effective policy to safeguard Americans with the right to bear arms. I'd like to thank our host today, New York University here in Washington, for partnering partnering with us on this thought leader discussion and of course our esteemed panel of experts with us here today. We welcome those in our audience and online where this is being streamed on Facebook Live. Blacksburg, Chicago, Charleston, Ferguson, Newtown, Orlando, San Bernardino. A day barely goes by when we don't learn of another shooting in the U.S. Our discussion today is timely with the 10-year anniversary of the mass shooting at Virginia Tech observed this week. 30 people were gunned down and over 20 others were injured before the gunman turned the weapon on himself. The shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary where 20 children and seven adults were senselessly shot and killed occurred nearly five years ago today. After that shooting, it finally appeared that responsible uh, gun reform measures might actually be in sight, but no such luck. Even the loss of 20 defenseless children between the ages of six and seven failed to sway Congress to enact a ban on assault weapons or an expansion of background checks on gun purchases. This week, in fact, marks four years since those bills were defeated in the United States Senate. It seems the right time to revisit this issue, and we will do that today with our terrific panel, who are all innovators in their field working to address this complicated national epidemic. Today we are joined by my friend and respected colleague Sandra Galea, Dean of Boston University School of Public Health, the Honorable Karen Freeman Wilson, an attorney, former judge, Attorney General of Indiana and now Mayor of Gary, Indiana, Adam Skaggs, litigation director with the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence and a member of the Firearms Accountability Task Force, Daniel Webster, expert and co-author of Reducing Gun Violence in America, and finally, Bob Wilcox with the nonprofit Every Town for Gun Safety, a movement of Americans working together to end gun violence and build safer communities. The format for today's discussion will be for each of our panelists to speak for approximately 10 minutes. This will be followed by a Q&A session that I will moderate, including taking questions from our audience here at NYU and online. Our first speaker is Dr. Galea. It is now my privilege to introduce him. He is a physician and an epidemiologist, and he is the Robert A. Knox Professor and Dean at the Boston University School of Public Health. Prior to his appointment at Boston University, Dr. Galea served as the Gelman Professor and Chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dean Hilton, for inviting me. Thank you, uh, uh, my fellow panelists, and you all for being here. I'm um, a physician. I'm an epidemiologist by training, as uh, Dean Hilton said. So my task as leading off this uh, panel is really just to, to frame the issue. And uh, I want to frame, broadly speaking, sort of what we know about firearms and population health from a very much a public health perspective. And I'll, I'll start building a little bit on what Cheryl said. We've been thinking a lot about firearms um, lately, in no small part because of events like this. So this is the Orlando Pulse uh, nightclub shooting where 49 people died, which was the um, worst uh, shooting in U.S. history. And when things like this happen, they are uh, they're obviously heart-wrenching and uh, they um, attract a lot of attention. What um, unfortunately gets lost in the uh, public conversation churn is that uh, these events are are, there's space between them, and there are a lot of other things going on in between these events. This is the month and a half after the Orlando Pulse shooting, and these are the other shootings of four or more people. And uh, what you actually see here is the yellow are people who are injured and the red were people who were killed. And uh, I would venture to guess that nobody here in the audience heard about any of these, really. Um, we heard about the Pulse shooting, but we don't hear about these. And these were in a month and a half, just in a month and a half afterwards. Um, in fact, our attention has really been turned a lot to these events lately because of this, this genuine increased incident in active shooter incidents that's been happening in the US, um, which makes for a compelling story and scares us a lot. Um, but the reality is that these mass shootings are actually account for a very small part of the problem, that they're really only about 2% of the problem. The problem, now epidemiologically, is this. So this is number of national firearm deaths, um, 81 to 2015. And uh, what you actually see here is that uh, firearm deaths were quite high um, uh, from the sort of mid-80s to early 90s, then they came down, but then essentially been plateaued. There's been a plateau overall firearm deaths 
for about the past 15, 16 years with this uh, rather alarming increase of late in the past year. And I'm going to let other people actually speak more about that. Now, sometimes when I show this, um, understandably enough in audiences who particularly are not uh, dwelling in epidemiologic data, you get the question, okay, well, maybe that's okay because, you know, things were high, then they went down, maybe we plateaued, but, you know, maybe everything's plateaued. Maybe we actually haven't done much on other things, but that's not the case. I mean, you can compare this. I'm often looking for a comparison uh, for gun-related injury, be it a death or non-fatal injury. I think motor vehicle injuries is a reasonable comparison, and this is what's happened with gun violence compared to motor vehicle injuries. So gun violence is the purple, and that's what I showed you before. Right? You see the rise from the uh, sort of early 80s all the way 90s comes down a plateau from about 2000 on. But look at what's happening with, with motor vehicles, right? See, we've had a steady decrease with motor vehicles. And motor vehicles and, uh, and uh, guns are now sort of vying for roughly um, uh, equal number of, uh, of deaths. So we've actually improved substantially um, our motor vehicle deaths. And, and I would ask you just to reflect for a second that we've actually done that without taking anybody's cars away. Right? So, 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 so this is part of sort of trying to use data to inform some of the public rhetoric around this, that one can actually make a big difference in the adverse health consequences of a consumer product, which is cars, without doing some of the things that in the public conversation tend to animate a lot of and inflame a lot of passions. Now, one of the key dimensions of um, the epidemiology of firearms and firearms and uh, population health, which one just simply cannot forget, is that it is very much a there's very much a racialized epidemiology. So this is looking at the same trend I showed you before, see the same flat line from 2000 on, with this increase over at the far right, but this is broken down by other races, white and black. So this is, from a, more, from a fatality point of view, has been disproportionately, consistently, and about a 50 to 70% increase among blacks compared to whites, and much more so than compared to other races over the past um, 15, 16, 17 years. Now, one of the challenges with thinking about population health is we're always sort of stuck saying, okay, well, this is what's happening in the country, that's fine. Well, I mean, is that a problem? Is this high? Is this low? And I appreciate it. I appreciate that when you're not thinking about public health all the time, you're like saying, like, how does this compare? Well, we can compare things to other countries. So this is homicides in particular. This is uh, our homicide uh, rate by firearms per million people. That's the United States versus all, versus a number of the other high-income countries showing um, how high up we are compared to other countries. Now, this is, of course, what attracts a lot of our attention, homicides. But one needs to take a sort of pause and say that is really an important part of the firearms and public health issue, but it's, in fact, just one of a much more complex picture because, in fact, most firearm-related deaths in this country are not homicides. They're actually suicides. So most are not people killing other people, it's people killing themselves. So this looks at the trends now in uh, suicides versus, and homicides. So the red line is homicides and the blue line is suicide. So the red line is the same line as I've shown you now three times, right? roughly flat for the past 15 years with this increase in the past year. But suicides has been going up for about the past seven, seven, eight years. And these are very different phenomena that are going on, but there are more suicides than there are homicides. One of the challenges that one has when one talks about suicides in this case is you get this notion as well. You talk about suicides in the context of firearms, but suicides, if, if one, there were to be fewer guns, people will still find other ways of killing themselves. Well, it's true to some extent, but a lot of suicides, the suicidology is a very difficult field. It's a very difficult field epidemiologically, a very difficult field from any methodological approach. But it is well documented that a substantial proportion of suicides are ultimately impulsive. And impulsivity matters a lot as to what means of what, what lethal or non-lethal means are available to one. And one of the best studies on this was a study that was done in Indiana and uh, looking at the uh, fatality of suicide attempts and showing that if you try to cut yourself to kill yourself, you have a 5% chance of killing yourself. Try to overdose, you have about 7%. If you try to shoot yourself with a gun, you have about 97% chance of killing yourself. Right? So, and there's other studies that show these numbers fluctuate. I mean, these numbers can go up. And, but, but the general message is roughly the same, that if you have a firearm available for an impulsive, for an impulsive act like a suicide attempt, that impulsive act is much more likely to be successful. The, the term that's used in the field is actually successful suicide. It's a very grim term, but it is a suicide that is carried through to completion. So in terms of suicides, there is a very particular role of firearms in terms of enabling suicide attempts to become successful suicides. Now, a small shift, because one of the things in the national conversation around uh, firearms is that's been very much dominated 
by firearm mortality, which is reasonable because you have about 32, 33,000 people a year dying from firearms. And then remember, as I said, most of those are actually suicide. But the public conversation has much less, has focused much, much less on non-fatal injuries, on people who actually are shot with a gun, who have a bullet go through their body. So when you look at that, this is from a paper that we just published, uh, trying to look at um, 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 the pie chart, you have about one third of um, firearm injuries which are fatal. Then you have about another third which are more minor, in, minor injuries. Many of those are accidents. But then you have another third that is actually admitted to hospital. So you have about two thirds as many injuries as there are fatal, uh, fatal uh, firearm <coughs> injuries. Now, these data are imperfect, these data are incomplete, simply because we actually don't have definitive registries of these things nationally. But we have shown, and a recent paper just came out, that actually the firearm non-fatal injuries are going up, even as the fatal firearm injuries here is the bottom bar, which is roughly stayed the same as I showed you. This ends in 2013, so you don't see the, late, the latter day spike. But you see um, a gradual slow increase in non-fatal firearm injury, which, actually, which makes a lot of sense, particularly given that we have gotten much better at dealing with things in emergency departments and triaging things and making sure that people with significant injuries actually are um, kept alive. Now, we have another paper that's coming out soon that looks at the burden of non-fatal firearm injury where we compare it, for example, to motor vehicle um, injuries. And we show that the burden of firearm injury, non-fatal, is much more substantial as measured by rehospitalization and burden of injury on the survivors than it is for motor vehicle injury. And there are a number of reasons for that which I can talk about. Now, I want to conclude, and I want to just conclude about the issue of guns, because it's actually very hard, I think, to talk about firearms and population health without actually talking about the firearms themselves. And I, and I left this for the end because, in some respects, this is the stickiest part of my talk from, a, um, a, from part of the flames passions point of view. And uh, because the, the, the question is, uh, that typical, I'm sorry, we're dealing with firearm injury. Well, maybe we can talk about that without actually dealing with firearms. I don't think we can. I don't think we actually can do that without addressing the fact that there are a lot of firearms in this country. This is uh, my, my favorite simple graphic on this from Vox, which shows the US is about 4% of the world's population, but the US owns about 42% of the world's guns. And uh, we have actually been owning more and more guns. Um, uh, uh, this is over the past, uh, was it like 20 years? And the um, US probably has about 300 million guns concentrated mostly in the hands of about 50 million people. So you end up with this, with this high gun ownership ratio among the people who have guns. And then comes to the question then of, well, are guns associated with gun death or injury? Which at face value might sound a little bit ridiculous, but it's in the public conversation, right? There's this very, there's this discussion. This is not a fringe discussion. This is a mainstream political discussion um, that was held that was had at the highest levels of the political uh, game in this country, um, um, where, well, guns are not really the problem because you want to have more guns so that you can keep the bad guys from killing you. So leaving aside what I said about suicide, right, the question from a scientific point of view, well, if you have more guns, are you more likely to have gun-related injury? And this is one of those fields where, from my perspective, the simple question, if there are more guns around, is there going to be more gun injury? From my perspective, the science on this is settled. I think the science on this has actually been settled for quite some time. And I think insofar as there's a public discussion on it, it's either a misinformed public discussion or a public discussion where there's been doubt has been sown where there shouldn't have been. So just to show you a couple of key um, figures on this, this is a very, very simple ecologic level correlation looking at gun ownership and uh, gun deaths per state, showing very clearly the states with more gun ownership, the more likely you are to have gun deaths. But one can go back to some classic work all the way back, this is 1993. This is uh, from uh, Professor Art Kellerman's group, which I thought was the first paper to definitively make this case. All I want you to see here is if you just look down below, you have method of homicide, firearm versus other homes where there is a gun. People are much more likely to be killed by a gun. That was, in, that was shown in 93. This paper had a lot of implications for a number of other political things in the country, which I actually won't get into. And there have been several other papers since that have shown the same thing. Um, this is from a paper from Linda Dahlberg and CDC showing that the likelihood of, um, of uh, being injured by a gun, either homicide or suicide, when there is a gun present is much higher than when there is no gun present. And there have been many meta-analyses. For those of you who are not in the scientific field, this is simply a meta-analysis. All you want to see here is that the top is suicide, the bottom is homicide. And uh, what you want to see is the big uh, um, uh, summary estimate, which is the, the diamond on the right, which is you're about three times as likely to die of, 
of gun-related suicide when there is a gun in the home, and you're about two times as likely to die of a gun-related homicide when there is a gun in the home. So the notion that us having more guns and more guns available so that we can use it to shoot the bad guys to pre prevent ourselves from actually getting killed by guns is, from my perspective, belied by the data. Because the data suggest if there is a gun around, you're A, three times more likely to kill yourself using a gun, and B, you're twice as likely to die from a gun or somebody else shooting you. I will stop there. I think that's a summary of the epidemiologic uh, data of where it's at, but uh, hopefully it sets us up now for uh, my colleagues to go into detail in, um, in all of these areas. So let me introduce our next speaker. The next speaker is uh, Professor Daniel Webster, who is the author of the acclaimed book, Reducing Gun Violence in America. Uh, professor Webster is the Professor of Health Policy and Management at the Hopkins Bloomberg Public Health, where he also serves as Director of the Center for Gun Policy Research, Deputy Director of Research for the Center for Prevention of Youth Violence, and also directs the PhD program in Health and Public Policy. And um, substantively, Professor Webster has really been um, one of the pioneers of doing uh, gun-related research in this country for a couple of decades. Daniel. I, first of all, it's great to be part of this panel um, and so glad that uh, NYU's uh, chosen to uh, address this very important public health problem. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is almost the impossible, which is in, in roughly 10 minutes, I'm going to summarize what I think are the most key bits of research evidence to inform um, strategies to reduce gun violence in America. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, detail on any one study, but my, my goal here is just give you the over, overarching um, takeaways from what I think are the key uh, policy and programmatic issues that we face. Um, shortly after the tragedy at uh, Newtown, uh, a group of researchers and other interested parties formed something we call the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearm Policy. Uh, and fundamental to, to the work of that group was um, recognizing that um, in many places, federally uh, and, and in many states, um, there are a lot of uh, risk, uh, risky conditions, risky uh, behaviors that are very predictive of violence that are not disqualifiers uh, currently in, in many states. And I want to show you a little bit of the evidence relevant to that. Uh, in 2002, uh, Kate Vitties and my other colleagues of mine at Johns Hopkins published a study in which we uh, examined, uh, we looked at a, a, f a federal uh, database for people in, uh, incarcerated in state prisons. And we looked at the subset who were in state prisons because they committed a violent crime with a gun. And what we particularly wanted to know is, um, were the individuals committing these cr crimes prohibited from possessing the guns that they used when they committed that violent crime? And we, we looked, we were very familiar with the policies, and we knew that there were 13 states that basically had the lowest standards for uh, legal gun possession. In, in those states, we found that 40% uh, of those uh, gun, uh, violent gun criminals uh, were legal possessors. The most important part of this very simple pie chart uh, of relevance is that red slice. 29% of the offenders in these states would have been legally prohibited from possessing the firearm that they used that got them in, incarcerated if they were in states with higher standards. So when you look from state to state, you can go from anywhere from 40% to uh, almost 70% of the individuals involved um, committing gun violence who are prohibited. So any policy, we talk a lot about background checks and other policies to keep guns from pro prohibited individuals, but you have to recognize the set of risky individuals uh, who are prohibited very enormously from state to state. Here are the uh, very specific set of policy recommendations that we put forward through our consortium uh, to focus on more risk-based firearm policy, sort of uh, low-hanging fruit. Um, one is uh, prohibitions for short-term involuntary hospitalization uh, because someone uh, was a danger to themselves or others. Um, violent misdemeanors. Um, 
uh, it turns out that if you've committed a violent misdemeanor, your risk compared to those who hadn't uh, uh, committed such a uh, crime is about almost tenfold higher. Um, so this is a very risky subset. Um, people who have repeated alcohol and drug offenses, um, temporary restraining orders for domestic violence. Um, what we know is that if, if you look at the epidemiology for intimate partner homicide, a very um, significant portion are killed um, very shortly in this period uh, in which they're seeking protection from the court. They're, they're going to the court because they, they've, in some of them anyway, feel their life is in danger. So, um, so extending these uh, other, the pro prohibitions that are in place federally and in most states uh, to extend them to temporary orders. And then a new, a whole new policy uh, uh, evolved out of this, something that's sometimes referred to as gun violence restraining orders, other times in Washington, uh, just passed a rem referendum where they call it extreme risk protection, but they, they function very similar to a domestic violence restraining order, but expands the context so that people can act quickly to disarm someone that's clearly all the signs are um, that they mean harm to themselves or others. When, uh, what does the evidence say when you expand these uh, firearm pr prohibitions? We have a growing body of evidence showing that domestic violence restraining order firearm prohibitions are linked with reductions in an intimate partner homicide, anywhere from 16 to 19 percent. Um, some research uh, being led by April Zioli at Michigan State that I'm collaborating on um, uh, is finding that the policy impacts are far greater the, the more of uh, uh, domestic violence offenders are captured, meaning the temporary orders, uh, whether all intimate partners versus uh, sp only spouses are covered, and they also are more protective when there is a permit to purchase law in, in place. Uh, there's also research showing, uh, in, for example, in California, 29 percent reduction in uh, violent misdemeanors committing violent crimes uh, following their uh, prohibitions. And in our work that I just mentioned with Dr. Zioli, we're finding uh, that broad, not just domestic violence misdemeanors, but all violence m misdemeanor disqualifiers uh, are frankly among the most effective uh, policies in reducing intimate partner homicide, roughly 20% reduction. Um, I'm going to fly through some other things. So. Um, the next piece is, okay, how do we prevent what I call diversions, diversions from legal to illegal context to prohibited people? Um, so I'm going to share a little evidence on this. This is just a summary of some research that we did looking at um, when a small number of dealers are accounting for a very large share of guns uh, that are recovered in crime in a local area. Um, you can do undercover stings, crackdowns on those individuals, and in some cases actually sue them, although the uh, lawmakers have made suing f uh, far more difficult, um, uh, protecting the, the gun sellers. But we've, we've seen uh, pretty substantial reductions in diversions of guns following these events, uh, diversions of guns for criminal use. Um, we've also, in a number of different studies, uh, look at correlations uh, using the gun trace, uh, um, crime gun trace data, and found that comprehensive background checks, where you extend the background check requirements beyond just uh, at the dealer level to private transactions, uh, licensing or permit to purchase of gun, of gun purchasers, and gun red, uh, Registration is a little bit difficult to tease out its independent effects because it's commonly wrapped up into uh, permitting and licensing laws. But strong uh, retail dealer oversight and regulation, as well as requiring um, mandatory reporting to law enforcement if you lose your gun or your gun is stolen, all of these are correlated with uh, how commonly or quickly guns are diverted for criminal use after their sale. We have a, um, a handful of uh, case studies of pretty fairly dramatic and important um, state policy changes. Uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, somewhat rapidly. The most recent, <clears throat> excuse me, was about a decade ago. <clears throat> 
in the state of Missouri where they, uh, for many decades, had in place a, a licensing or a permitting process for handguns. Um, uh, a permit was good for 30 days, and you went to your local sheriff uh, to be vetted for this, where, of course, there was background checks and so on. Um, what uh, this uh, bar graph shows is a, is a metric for uh, diversion of, from retail sale to criminal use and very in a very short amount of time. This is one indicator of diversions of guns to criminals. And we found roughly a twofold increase in this indicator following the repeal of this law. We also found something incredibly unusual when you track the uh, percent of guns uh, recovered in crime that originate from the state where the crime occurred. Um, normally that is a very stable thing over, over time. In Missouri, when the, they repealed their law, it went from about 56% of their guns uh, used in crime being homegrown Missouri guns, and now it's about three quarters of those guns. This is perhaps the most important uh, uh, thing to track is uh, Missouri's gun homicide rate, and what I simply did here is a, a difference between Missouri's and the rest of the United States, what direction they were heading. You see a very abrupt increase uh, coinciding with the repeal of this law beginning in 2008. You have another phenomenon that's probably contributing to that in 2015 um, with uh, uh, a variety of things with policing as well as other um, uh, reducing of, of handgun regulations. When we've examined this in a number of outcomes, um, currently our estimate for what uh, impact this had is a 20% increase in firearm homicide rates. Uh, no other state had a larger change in its gun homicide rates over those years than did Missouri. Um, we also found in, uh, that it, the policy was correlated with more officers, law, law enforcement officers being shot in the line of duty and an increased firearm homicide rate of 16%. So roughly uh, about 114 excess deaths per year connected to this policy change. Now Connecticut did sort of the mere opposite of the policy change in Missouri. They adopted the same, the same set of policies relevant to permit to purchase or licensing the one principal difference was that Connecticut also had a uh, safety training requirement, uh, eight hours of safety training. We've estimated the impacts of this law for over the first 10 years. Our estimate was a 40% reduction in gun homicide rates. When we extend the, uh, over uh, the most recent data, our estimate is 29% lower homicide rates following this, this uh, change. We also uh, correlate that change with an 80% reduction in fatal, uh, fatal shootings of law enforcement officers with handguns, 15% uh, reductions in gun suicides. What do we know about uh, comprehensive background checks? Without, uh, basically the policy changes I described simultaneously were ch changing licensing or permitting along with background checks. What about if you just do the background checks without the permitting. We have some current uh, studies underway looking at uh, data from Maryland, Pennsylvania, from laws passed back in the 1990s. What we're finding is uh, discouraging uh, levels of enforcement of these laws. It's uh, very, very rare that these um, uh, vi violations are prosecuted, and compliance is a problem. We're also finding uh, that uh, we do not find an association with lower homicide rates with the passage of these laws. The one sort of um, more encouraging thing was when uh, uh, much later in the game, when there were sentence enhancements for uh, straw purchases, uh, a lot more cases were brought by prosecutors, and there appears to be some protective effect with uh, uh, gun homicide reductions uh, following that in Pennsylvania. Um, the things, one of the policy areas that gets the greatest attention now because it's where things are most active is so-called right to carry laws. And there's a lot of different kinds and I'm not gonna get into the weeds of that. 
But uh, um, uh, a guy named John Lott has published books and other things called More Guns, Less Violence, that where he uh, believes and shows his data linking these laws to lower to, to less violence, as the um, title implies. However, uh, this research has been very heavily scrutinized and found to be uh, fundamentally flawed. Um, what I think is the most difficult, both on the political side but also epidemiologically, is that most legal carriers or people who get these permits on as a group are below average group. They are generally a safe group. But it is a very large and heterogeneous group that does include some high-risk individuals for the reasons I was stating earlier. Um, the most recent studies that look at right to carry in the most, uh, with the most data and rigorous methods are consistently finding that these are correlated with more assaults with guns. Um, I want to briefly mention law enforcement here. I know this is public health, but there's actually a, a, an intervention that has a combination of law enforcement with other community components, something called focused deterrence. Basically, is based on looking at the data, we would call it epidemiology, then law enforcement, they might call it something different, but identifying the high-risk individuals in a particular area, usually this is in urban areas, they bring them in and communicate them dir very directly their risk and their the attention that they are going to give these individuals because they think they're driving gun violence. The message is also delivered not just by a police chief or a U.S. prosecutor, but by their own community members, people who are handpicked, selected because they are respected, they care about these individuals. They're also simultaneously offered a variety of services to take a different path with employment, assistance, substance abuse, treatment, and, and otherwise. And in, um, most recently, there's also a very explicit effort um, for what criminologists refer to as procedural justice, that you are implementing these approaches because it's a fair and appropriate way to do it. Uh, the track record on this intervention is incredibly impressive, uh, very consistent, not always, actually Baltimore sadly has been an exception, but generally in places that adopted this, they've had significant reductions in shootings. When this um, approach is applied specifically to try to Re, uh, reduce drug dealing, however, you had generally, with one exception in, in High Point, North Carolina, have not found reductions. So I think it is far easier to address in a most direct way gun violence, illegal gun possession, than it is uh, the big economy and social uh, economic factors driving drugs. Another public health, a public health intervention uh, known broadly as cure violence in Baltimore, we call it safe streets, that involves um, individuals known, uh, referred to as credible messengers, people often former gang members, known in those communities to reach out to those at highest risk, the same that would be bring, brought in for focused deterrence communications. And, um, uh, try to help mediate conflicts and steer them in a direct, uh, uh, towards new norms for dealing with conflicts. In Baltimore, we've had this for about a decade, and on average, over that decade, about a 27% lower uh, rate of shootings uh, uh, estimated for the areas that uh, where Safe Streets is working. Um, so, conclusions. Higher standards for gun owners matters. Um, strong evidence on permit to purchase. Uh, I have other evidence I didn't share, but. It's, it's very consistent that a licensing or permit to purchase is quite effective. Comprehensive background checks in order to be effective need to actually be prosecuted uh, and enforced. Um, more gun carrying, while uh, there are many safe gun car carriers at a population level, it tends to lead to more shootings. Um, and as I said, focused deterrence and outreach with, uh, to interrupt violence has, um, when implemented properly, had uh, encouraging effects in reducing urban gun violence. Our next speaker is um, Adam Skaggs. He's the litigation director of the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence and representative of the Firearms Accountab Accountability Task Force. Um, 
Adam, take it away. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and thanks to NYU for uh, hosting us here and, and convening this important discussion. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different tack and, and concentrate on the legal uh, regime, the legal framework in which uh, the dynamics we've been talking about play out. And I'm, I'm going to kind of unpack, uh, I think, a couple of the points that were implicit in, in what Daniel was talking about, um, in particular try and make clear to all of you uh, that we have not a single gun control or, or gun violence policy in this country. What we really have is a patchwork of, uh, of different laws that vary dramatically from region to region, from state to state, and uh, in some cases, locality to locality. So that's, that's the first key point I want to make, is that th we have no national gun policy in, in this country. Uh, and uh, as a result, we have the opportunity to see the kind of research that Daniel summarized so effectively, uh, which is that levels of gun violence, rates of gun deaths, uh, vary fairly widely, fairly dramatically across the country. Uh, and uh, while uh, we heard earlier that lower levels of gun ownership are correlated with lower levels of gun violence, well, stronger gun laws are also correlated in the same way uh, with lower levels of gun violence. So the types of policies that we pass uh, are not, forgive uh, the expression, none of them are a silver bullet to solve this problem, but uh, they are important and they do correlate to uh, to reducing this problem. The, the last point that I want to make, which is not really one directly, I suppose, applicable to the public health argument, but I think is an important one given the politics and the political rhetoric that we see on this issue. For folks who are interested in reducing gun violence in this country, I think it's crucial to, uh, for us to, to make very clear uh, that the arguments we hear that we can't do anything about this problem because we have a sacred Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms and carry them with us at all times, uh, those are fundamentally misleading arguments. Uh, uh, the types of gun policies that Daniel's research and other, others research focus on uh, and that I'll be talking about today um, are consistent with a long-standing tradition of regulating guns that goes back to the founding, uh, to the time we, we we, uh, our, the founders wrote the Second Amendment. Indeed, it goes back centuries before that to the colonial period, to our roots uh, in Anglo-American law. Uh, and uh, it is just fundamentally misleading and I would suggest counterproductive uh, to, to be saddled with the sort of rhetoric that says we can't do anything about the problem because of the Constitution. The Constitution is not and never has been an impediment uh, to addressing gun violence and, and reducing it. So let me turn to the first point, which is just to talk uh, about the patchwork of laws across the country. Um, again, some of this, I think, uh, was implicit in what Daniel was talking about, but I want to spell it out a little bit more. We have federal gun laws. Congress has passed a certain number of, of laws, and those provide sort of a floor uh, for regulating guns across the country, but it's a very incomplete uh, way of regulating the, the issue. So federal law does require some background checks before you can purchase a gun. Uh, and indeed, uh, people, I think, across the country have the, the uh, misconception that in order to buy a gun, you need to go and pass a background check and prove that you're not a criminal or you're not uh, subject to a restraining order, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's true insofar as you want to purchase a gun at a, uh, a brick and mortar store, a federally licensed gun dealer. Uh, but those are the only sales that federal law requires a background check on, uh, and so it captures some, uh, some gun sales but not others. Uh, in most states around the country, all you have to do to buy a gun without a background check is to go online uh, to any number of websites, including things like Facebook up until recently, uh, and find somebody willing to sell you a gun, willing to meet you in the parking lot at McDonald's, sell you the gun for cash, no questions asked. That's entirely legal in most of this country. Uh, so federal law is incomplete that way. It's incomplete in terms of the prohibitions. Uh, and indeed, it's both under-inclusive in that many people uh, that are, uh, exhibit signs of dangerousness to themselves or to the others are not captured by uh, our federal uh, gun prohibitions and, in fact, are legally permitted uh, to own guns. Uh, but it also then is over-inclusive, particularly when it comes to mental health. Uh, the federal prohibitions on mental health were written 
uh, nearly 50 years ago, half century ago, and they're entirely um, uh, incompatible with modern understandings of mental health. So if we had a more functional political system, I think there's a lot we could do on that. Uh, that's probably another uh, discussion altogether, so I'll, uh, I'll just leave that for now. Uh, federal law is also inconsistent in the way, or, or incomplete, I should say, in the way that it addresses guns. So machine guns, uh, fully automatic weapons, which can fire an unlimited number of bullets with a single pull of the trigger, are very heavily regulated. They have been since uh, the early part of the uh, 20th century. But guns that are virtually uh, indistinguishable from them, except that you need to pull the trigger each time to fire a shot, so-called semi-automatic weapons, are very uh, lightly uh, regulated, if at all, under federal law. Uh, and so with all of these, with all of these issues and, and many others, the question then becomes, well, what have the states done uh, to do anything about the holes in federal law? And the, the short answer there, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, is that the states have taken a widely uh, different set of approaches to that. We have uh, states with very strong laws, states with very weak laws, permissive laws, uh, and a lot of the science, uh, the, the research that, uh, that we've heard about already, uh, underscores that the, these laws matter, uh, that, that with particular laws, uh, passing strong laws can make a big difference. The last sort of layer of the regulatory regime is local laws. Now, in more than 40 states, the state legislatures, uh, in their infinite wisdom, have decided that localities, cities, despite the fact that cities are the locus of so much of the gun violence that we face in this country, 40 plus state legislatures have said cities have no right to regulate guns whatsoever. Uh, now they're doing things like saying, and if cities try, have the gall to try and do something about gun violence, we're going to sue you and you, you're going to have to use taxpayer dollar to pay the lawyers who sue you for trying to address the problem. Uh, that's a problem for many reasons, uh, but in the uh, about six or seven states that allow localities to regulate guns, we've seen cities doing uh, things to address the issue that have helped further reduce gun violence uh, in particular jurisdictions. So drilling into a couple of the examples, uh, background checks that we've heard a, a bit about, uh, again, are not required on sales by non-dealers, non-licensed dealers in uh, more than 30 states. Uh, and this is despite the fact that there's broad public support, not only among the public in general, uh, where you'll find that nine out of 10 Americans believe one should have to pass a background check before one can purchase a deadly weapon, but even among gun owners, Republicans, NRA members, there's very high support uh, for these policies. And yet, as I discussed, uh, federal law doesn't require comprehensive background checks, and even after the tragedy at Sandy Hook, uh, when a majority of United States senators voted to extend our background checks laws because uh, they were not able to overcome a filibuster, that important gap, significant gap in federal law continues. The other piece of the background check system uh, that is not uniform ac across the country is the extent to which states are uh, effective in getting records of prohibited persons into the system. A background check system is only as effective as the records it contains are complete, uh, and yet in many states we don't see, particularly when it comes to mental health records from uh, involuntary uh, uh, commitments, to adjudications of people as being mentally incompetent to stand trial, that sort of thing. Many states, we don't see those records getting into the system so that gaps remain such as the type that allowed uh, the shooter at Blacksburg and Virginia Tech uh, who had been committed, who should not have under federal law been allowed to purchase a gun, was able to pass a background check anyway because those systems hadn't gotten into it. So we see wide variety across the states in the ability to which they maintain the effectiveness of the background check system by submitting records. So that's background checks and how it varies across the country. Uh, domestic violence is another situation. Uh, under federal law, there are certain uh, categories of, of uh, domestic uh, abusers who are prohibited from owning guns, uh, but those laws are incomplete. Uh, they uh, apply to people who are married or formerly were married, but they don't apply to people who have dating relationships, even though a tremendous amount of uh, domestic abuse occurs within intimate partner relationships uh, where there is no marriage. Uh, they vary across the states uh, in terms of whether a conviction for a misdemeanor domestic battery offense is, uh, uh, prohibits possession under state law, uh, whether particular types of restraining orders with uh, 
non-spouses with intimate partners are prohibiting uh, certain states prohibit uh, possession of guns by people convicted of misdemeanor stalking offenses. Most states do not. The states vary to whether police officers responding to domestic violence uh, uh, incidents are required to inquire or empowered to uh, retrieve guns from the domestic violence situation. Um, and it's beyond the scope of what I want to talk about today to get into all the ways that they differ in that. But I just wanted to put up these two maps which have to do with state laws regarding gun possession by convicted stalkers and then co convicted domestic abusers. And the point here is just to look at the wide variety of different colors representing different types of policies, whether federal law is the only law on this issue, whether there's state law that is good or bad or weak or strong state law. The point is, again, this patchwork of uh, a wide variety of different approaches at the states. The last example I want to make is the one I talked about earlier as far as types of weaponry that are regulated <laughs> under federal law. So as I said, fully automatic machine guns like the M16, which is standard issue for our troops in the field, uh, that is heavily regulated under federal law. A semi-automatic version, on the other hand, isn't regulated at all under federal law. Now, it's a little bit facetious to show these two pictures because they look pretty similar, but the point is aside from whether it's capable of automatic fire or only capable of firing in a semi-automatic mode, uh, uh, these guns are widely, uh, the, the regulation of these guns under federal law is, is almost polar opposites. Um, and of course, the semi-automatic version of this is the type of uh, gun that was used in a litany of tragedies that I won't even recite here, but that we're all, all too familiar with. Uh, and so again, it falls to the states. Are they going to regulate this? Some states prohibit possessions of, of, of possession of guns like this uh, or limit it uh, very strictly. Others have uh, no restraints on this type of weaponry. Indeed, in much of the country, one can walk down the street openly displaying uh, this type of semi-automatic uh, rifle uh, without, uh, without uh, doing anything that's illegal. Um, this, of course, leads to incidents where people become alarmed and frightened. Uh, when seeing someone like this walk into the grocery store. But again, in a lot of the country, that's entirely legal up until the point that you begin firing the weapon. So there's a huge variety, as I said, of different approaches at the state level to the laws uh, uh, that govern gun possession and so forth. Which brings me to the second point, which I think was, uh, again, something that came out in a number of the studies we've heard about earlier this morning, which is that with particular types of gun laws, uh, we see uh, significant reductions or associations with significantly lower levels of gun violence. My organization, uh, the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, annually goes through and sees what the changes have been in state gun laws. Uh, we've seen in the last several years several states uh, acting to strengthen their laws and adopting a number of important policies. Unfortunately, we've seen a number of states doing the opposite thing. So every year we assess what the changes are and we assign, uh, based on a, a sort of package of a variety of different laws, letter grades. And uh, admittedly, some of the choices are a bit arbitrary and, you know, how do you weight one policy versus another? Uh, but overall, what we found is that the states that have the stronger laws, perhaps uh, unsurprisingly, are associated with lower levels of gun death. Uh, so that's the basic point. The stronger the gun laws, uh, the, the, the lower the rate of gun death. I'm not going to go into a, an awful lot of detail. Uh, we've heard about background checks, particularly in states that use the permit to purchase, uh, where uh, the rates of, of, of gun violence come down. I think the best uh, studies that uh, sort of illuminate this phenomenon are the studies involving Missouri, uh, where they got rid of the requirement and the rates went up, and Connecticut, where they imposed the requirement and uh, rates went down. Uh, but in general, if you look at all the states, there are 18 states that have closed that background check loophole in federal law, either through a permit to purchase system or through a point of, con uh, point of, of sale background check. So in other words, when you buy a, a gun from somebody, you can't do it in the parking lot at McDonald's. You have to go and have a background check conducted. Um, what we've seen is significant reductions in the number of women who are shot to death by intimate partners suicides involving a firearm, and law enforcement killed with uh, a firearm other than their own service weapon. Uh, so I'm not suggesting there's a simple causal relationship between adopting a background check law. I don't think uh, uh, 
there would be evidence to support that claim, but certainly uh, we do see this correlation in lower deaths where we do impose things like a background check through, especially as Daniel said, a permit to purchase. Um, Another example is California. My organization was formed after uh, a mass shooting at a California law firm by a disgruntled former client who came uh, almost a quarter century ago uh, with some semi-automatic assault weapons and uh, killed a number of people, injured many more. And so our organization, which has a national reach today, really got its start focusing in California. And we passed first at the local level, then at the state level, a package of laws that is really probably more comprehensive uh, than anywhere else, certainly among the strongest gun laws across the country. And what we've seen is that over that time, California's uh, gun violence, gun death uh, levels have uh, have reduced significantly, and now California is generally ahead of the curve. Um, so we believe that that example is a powerful one for underscoring that uh, there are cultural, there are any number of different uh, issues that need to, need to be addressed before one can expect to bring these levels of gun violence down, but certainly smart policy, strong gun laws is a key piece of that. Uh, so that brings me to the last point that I want to make, which is to rebut this notion that somehow the types of policies that we advocate that we're talking about today uh, somehow violate the fundamental constitutional rights of Americans. As I said, that's simply not true. Uh, and again, if you look back at our history, uh, the types of gun laws that we had indeed in the founding era were far more restrictive than the types of gun laws that we have today. You look at the time of the Revolutionary War, uh, state governments uh, maintained detailed registries of every firearm that uh, the citizens of particular states owned. Indeed, the condition they would have mandatory uh, inspections of these firearms, uh, and if somebody refused to uh, sign an, a loyalty oath to, to the government, uh, they could be disarmed. Those arms could be taken away. Now, you describe a, a, a government that has those kinds of policies to some of the folks that are against regulating guns, and I think it was a horrible totalitarian state of the sort that the Second Amendment was designed to prevent. Well, those are the people who wrote the Second Amendment, or the people that gave us those gun laws. So the notion uh, um, that, uh, that somehow the Constitution prevents us from addressing this problem is simply not true. Now, it is true that not quite a decade ago, the Supreme Court uh, took a case called uh, District, uh, District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, which involved a very restrictive gun uh, regulation, a couple of gun regulations here in the district. Uh, and in that case, the Supreme Court said for the first time in history uh, that the uh, Second Amendment didn't have anything to do with service in a militia, uh, an idea that had uh, taken uh, root for 200 years based on the first half of the Second Amendment that says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Uh, but in any event, in that decision, the Supreme Court by a five to four vote said, no, it doesn't have anything to do with the militia. Uh, it's an individual right. Uh, it gives law-abiding Americans a right to, to own a handgun for self-defense in the home. Uh, and uh, a city like D.C. that said you couldn't have a handgun and any gun you did have in, in the home had to be dismantled, couldn't be operative, it had to be locked, dismantled, um, uh, was unconstitutional. So folks have said, look, see, the Supreme Court finally told us this Second Amendment uh, means something and uh, therefore all these types of gun laws that advocates like, like, like me and, and some others support are, are unconstitutional. Well, they didn't say that in the Heller decision. Uh, indeed, in the Heller decision, the court uh, explicitly said it was not an unlimited right, uh, and it listed a number of different restrictions that were presumptively constitutional. So in Heller, uh, the court said uh, the Second Amendment is not a right to keep and carry any wep weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, for whatever purpose. And then it listed a series of different things that were presumably, uh, presumptively constitutional. So. Uh, laws prohibiting concealed carry, presumptively constitutional. Now this is a, a big issue because the Supreme Court may well take this up and we have a new justice on the Supreme Court who received very, uh, uh, I'll just say full-throated support from the National Rifle Association uh, in the tune of millions of dollars of TV spending and other support. Uh, and the Supreme Court is poised to decide whether uh, Americans have a right to carry hidden guns in public. Uh, 
that could come as, e as early as a week from Monday. We could hear that the Supreme Court is going to take up this issue. Uh, if they decide that in one way, states' ability to pass these strong gun laws uh, would be severely curtailed. Curl they may not take the case. They may take the case and rule in a way that preserves states' ability to regulate. We won't know for some time. Uh, but these issues may come to the Supreme Court very soon. Um, they also reiterated that uh, restrictions on carrying guns in sensitive places like schools and government buildings, conditioning uh, commercial sale of weapons, uh, requiring guns to be stored to prevent accidents, a wide range of these, uh, of these uh, laws were uh, presumptively constitutional. So there is room uh, under the laws to, to regulate uh, guns in a way that can uh, reduce gun violence. Uh, and in particular, uh, I think there are some sort of public health oriented solutions that uh, are important to doing that. So uh, Florida a few years ago passed a law that said uh, it violated the Second Amendment, or at least it infringed the Second Amendment, for doctors to ask their patients uh, whether they owned guns, and if so, whether they stored them safely out of children's reach. Uh, Florida said that was a violation of Floridians' uh, Second Amendment rights, so they made that, uh, they prohibited that, and they said doctors could lose their licenses if they asked, pediatricians could lose their medical licenses if they asked patients uh, about whether they had guns in the home. Thankfully, uh, the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta uh, just a few months ago struck that law down, again saying the Second Amendment is not this absolute right that prevents medical professionals from offering uh, their patients counsel about gun safety the same way they might about bicycle helmets or about uh, gates around swimming pools in the backyard. Uh, so uh, I think you know that was a case that really brought attention to the importance of uh, medical professionals in helping the public understand some of the uh, things that contribute to gun safety or reducing gun deaths, uh, and, and, and the, the, that's an important role, obviously. Uh, the, other, the other measure I would talk about is just this uh, gun violence res restraining order that the people of Washington, you heard earlier today, uh, called it an extreme risk protection order. Uh, these uh, policies that would allow uh, in some cases medical professionals, in other cases law enforcement or family members, uh, to identify someone exhibiting signs of dangerousness to themselves or to others, and then to have that person temporarily uh, prohibited, uh, at least while the dangerousness persists, uh, from owning guns. Uh, and that's a policy that we're seeing uh, introduced in, um, in, in numerous states across the country. Uh, it, it right now is moving through the Oregon legislature, may well pass there in the coming days or weeks. Uh, and those are the kinds of laws, I think, that are better tailored to our understanding of uh, the risk factors, what makes, uh, what creates situations of dangerousness, uh, and which we hope the medical community will, uh, will help to uh, advocate in our legislatures for the passage of. Um, so I'm going to wrap up uh, with that point, uh, and I guess I will now uh, uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, who is Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson. Uh, Mayor Freeman Wilson is an attorney, a former judge, former attorney general for the state of Indiana, uh, and currently serves uh, as mayor of Gary, Indiana. That is not, uh, not okay. the mayor, but <laughs> she, will, uh, will. she will speak with you next. So you get the propaganda slide. Good afternoon. Let me uh, take this opportunity to thank the dean and the entire NYU team for uh, not only convening this um, very important forum, but for allowing me to sit with this esteemed panel and for being such a tremendous host. I um, will tell you that I stopped here uh, on my way to Little Rock, and I understand the geography is a little off, and so uh, I want to apologize for what may seem to be an abrupt departure because I do have a three o'clock flight. But I thought this was important enough and um, I come to this a little different than my federal panelists. Um, after losing um, the race for mayor in 2003 and 2007, I had firmly decided that I would not be a candidate again. And then in December of 2010, 
while bringing my teenage daughter and some of her friends home for a party, from a party, I pulled into my driveway and noticed, uh, given my uh, prior experience, crime tape around my backyard. And after quickly getting the children in the house, of course, they would have objected to me calling them children at that time, um, I learned that a man had been killed behind my house. And so having firmly determined that I would not be a candidate, I thought that if I did not run, it would be an abdication of my responsibility to know as much as I knew about the criminal justice system and about violence and having experienced it and not try to do something. And so here I am. And um, notwithstanding that experience, I would tell you that we have made some progress. But I want to talk to you specifically about something that actually preexisted my administration in Gary and uh, that continues to go on. And um, I will also uh, indicate to you that we are involved in, in those efforts um, that were described earlier, I believe, by uh, Dr. Webster, where he talks about uh, intervening in a way that um, holds people accountable, provides services, and uh, also uh, requires them uh, requires the community to be integrally involved in saying to people the violence has to stop. Uh, for us, it's the group violence intervention method, and it has uh, certainly made a difference in the city of Gary. But in 2001, um, about three mayors ago, Scott King uh, came up uh, along with uh, a group of others uh, from the Brady Center and some other places with a novel concept that uh, gun manufacturers and gun distributors who were reckless and negligent in the delivery and the manufacturing of handguns should be held accountable. And as a result of that theory, Gary initiated a lawsuit against those manufacturers and dealers, like many other communities. And um, Gary's lawsuit is the only one in the country that is still standing. Uh, we saw in 05 the implementation of a federal law that said that you cannot sue gun manufacturers because of the uh, use of guns by third parties. Uh, states followed suit in Indiana. There was a law passed in 2007, and um, that law was even updated in 2015 in an effort to dismiss the lawsuit in Gary. And, and the lawsuit simply says that we know that there is not a a um, responsible way that these guns are distributed. We know that there are a handful of bad apple gun dealers. Uh, we saw the research earlier about the targeting of those bad apple gun dealers in Chicago and uh, how that led to a reduction in uh, those sales. Uh, the bad news, though, is that because Gary and Indiana is right next to Chicago, those who have been thwarted in their efforts to purchase guns in Illinois can now come to the great state of Indiana, who seems to be last in many, many categories, but who have uh, taken a place at the head of the class when it comes to straw purchases and purchases from gun shows creating a market for the purchase of guns in the city of Chicago and in other uh, communities adjacent to uh, Indiana, particularly Northwest Indiana and other parts of Ohio. 
Um, in addition to um, that fact, the um, lawsuit simply said that we know that the, there are bad Apple gun manu distributors, and we also know that manufacturers don't pay very close attention to these distributors, even though they know who they are, because they have a vested interest in making sure that these distributors do business, because if the distributors do good business, then of course the manufacturers do good business. That lawsuit uh, was taken up to the Indiana Supreme Court on summary judgment. It, uh, it was affirmed that the city could in fact proceed on the theories that I just described to you, even though they could not pr uh, proceed on the theory that it was uh, strictly strict negligence, a theory of strict negligence. And um, after being affirmed at the um, state Supreme Court level in Indiana, it was remanded back to the trial court, and then the statutes intervened both the federal and the state statute. Notwithstanding that fact, the um, lawsuit was able to prevail, and then in 2015, the Indiana General Assembly decided that uh, this had lingered out there too long, that uh, the Gary lawsuit was the only one standing, and they needed to do something. And so as a result, they passed a law that essentially said, we are dismissing this lawsuit, something that is uh, only uh, wise in Indiana. And notwithstanding the separation of powers, notwithstanding the fact that everybody has an entitlement to uh, the court system, and that law is now pending, uh, that uh, argument, summary judgment on that uh, law is now pending, uh, waiting for a judgment in a case where a police officer sued, or the family of police officers sued uh, a gun manufacturer based on the fact that um, the officer had been killed with a handgun, and uh, we are waiting the Indiana Supreme Court's ruling on that case to determine whether or not we can go forward. Uh, this is important work, and the reason that I know that it's important, uh, obviously you all are sitting here, but this morning when I was on my way to the airport, I got a call that yet another young man, Daryl Turner, had lost his life in the city of Gary, and it seems odd to say that it's only our seventh homicide. It seems barbaric to say that in those terms, but our numbers have gone down but they're not down far enough. So I'll stop with that and uh, indicate that it's my pleasure to introduce a friend, Rob Wilcox. And Rob is the Deputy Director of Federal Strategy for Every Town for Gun Safety, a movement of Americans working together to end gun violence and build safer communities. And I have to say that I'm honored to be a part of that uh, network as a, a member of the mayors demanding action and the moms demanding action uh, on gun violence. So please greet uh, Rob Wilcox. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor, for that warm introduction. Uh, she's right. We got to know each other in her office a few years ago, back when I was at the Brady Center, and I was I had the privilege of representing her in, uh, in that lawsuit. Um, and I'm, I'm here to kind of, I think we've heard a lot about the problem. We've heard about the laws and we've heard about what, what the mayor's doing in Gary, but I'd like to kind of frame this for you guys in terms of what's happening in Congress, what's happening in the state legislatures, and, and what you know, groups like Americans for Responsible Solutions and Every Town for Gun Safety are doing about it. Um, every town is a group of about three and a half million supporters. We have, uh, and, and we've kind of built this list by, by thinking about, you know, the groups of people that can get engaged on this issue and make an impact. 
And of course, we have mayors. We have an incredibly powerful network of mayors uh, against illegal guns, um, over about 1,000 current and former mayors, bipartisan, who are dedicated to looking for solutions to gun violence. Uh, another very important piece of this puzzle is our survivors, um, the people who've suffered directly from gun violence, especially from the, the weak and lax policies that allow guns to end up in the wrong hands. And we have an incredible network of survivors that are trained to tell their story. And we support them in that effort so that they can be in the community talking about the impact that these bad policies can have on, on them and on their families. And, and the last piece, which is incredibly important, is Moms Demand Action uh, for Gun Sense in America. And that is a network of volunteers that was started by Shannon Watts uh, after the, the Sandy Hook shooting that has grown into a, a kind of real force um, where we have chapters in all 50 states and they are grassroots volunteers who will go to the state house, they'll testify, they'll hold community meetings, they'll build partnerships um, with faith groups, with local community groups, all in an effort to, to make that voice of the 90% heard that Adam mentioned. I mean, you have to ask yourself, why if 90% of Americans support background checks? including 70% of gun owners, and why if 88% you know, of Americans think that having a concealed carry permit system is a good idea, you know, some training, a background check, some prohibitors before someone carry a gun in public, and will that many people think that, why are we going in the opposite direction? Why after hearing about the research, about what works, why are we not implementing those solutions? Why are we on the verge of passing an incredibly dangerous and chaotic bill in Congress? And the answer to that why is because we need to be building the movement of all of us to tell the story of the research, to tell the story of the laws, to tell the stories of the solutions, and go to the state houses and ask our elected officials, and, and go to Congress and ask our federal officials, urge them, tell them to do the right thing. And so what policy are we facing right now? And the rest of my remarks will be filtered through the policy. It's a policy called concealed carry reciprocity. And boy, does that sound innocent, right? Reciprocity, huh? That's even, equal. Concealed carry, you know, that's in the right hands. You know, may, maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, and that is, that is the gun lobby's title to sound innocent for a policy that is incredibly chaotic, incredibly dangerous. In essence, what this policy says is if you can carry a gun in one state, you can carry it anywhere. That, that also doesn't sound that bad, does it? Well, what's bad about it and what's really chaotic is that there are incredibly different standards in every state. And you know, it would be one thing if, if every state required training. It would be one thing if every state said, you know, if you've been convicted of a violent misdemeanor or multiple drunk driving um, episodes in a, in a small time period, well, if, you've done, if you have those prohibitors and you require the training, well, well maybe that's, that's a standard that we could all say is okay. Well, that's, not, that's not the case, um, you know, because you know, what we've seen is that the gun lobby has gone into states and dismantled their concealed carry systems. And in 12 states right now, and Daniel and, and Adam both alluded to this, what you have is something called permitless carry. And that means that as long as you're not federally prohibited, you could wake up one morning and say, today's the day I'm going to carry a gun in public. No training, no screening, no background check, no permit from law enforcement. You'll be able to carry in that community. That is incredibly dangerous, incredibly reckless, incredibly unpopular. In the places it's passed, and they are pushing hard to pass it. I mean, in 2009, the first time this concealed carry reciprocity bill was voted on in Congress, 2009, there was two states that were permitless. Alaska and Vermont. The US Senate voted on it again in 2013. Um, and there was four states. Now there's 12 states. There's 12 states that, that have effectively dismantled their laws. And that's what makes concealed carry reciprocity such a dangerous and chaotic policy, is that the permitless standard that is in place in Arizona means that, that that low standard, that weak standard, that no standard, will allow under concealed carry reciprocity those folks to carry in California, San Francisco, they carry in Las Vegas, carry in New York. 
you know, carry in places that they are, they are unequipped for and where there's no check screening or training to protect the community from a reckless, irresponsible, dangerous act. And so kind of, I think that the important thing to know about concealed carry reciprocity is it in no way is in putting in place a national standard. This is not gonna kind of create, raise up the floor as Adam was saying, so that we have a, a strong standard across the board. What it's gonna do is it's gonna take the states that have reasonable common sense gun laws and rip them down. I, I like to think about a place like New Mexico. You know, New Mexico has done the things that, that are right for New Mexico. Um, they require some training, they have some prohibitors, um, and in a state of two and a half million folks, they have about 40,000 permit holders. Now, that works for them. That's the system they want. And when it comes to the other states who they recognize, they have to have standards similar to New Mexico. That's what their legislature said. Now, under this concealed carry reciprocity law, well, that means their folks who can carry in the neighboring state of Arizona can all of a sudden carry New Mexico. Why is that a problem? The problem is that Arizona is a permitless state. So there's millions of people in Arizona who can carry without training, without a background check, without a permit from law enforcement, even if they have some of the risk factors that Daniel talked about. What does that mean for New Mexico? Well, if you look at their tourism data, you see that, you know, see how many Arizonans are coming into New Mexico on an annual basis? Well, it means that New Mexico is going to go from having zero legal permitless carriers to over a million. That is a significant and massive change for New Mexico that's going to be imposed on them from Washington, D.C. because of the gun lobby's view that, you know, we should be, this is the view that they're able to tear down all the systems at once and make the weakest link the law of the land. So, you know, this is an incredibly important policy to fight against. It is going to be the policy that will get kind of the, the, the attention of the NRA this year. It's their number one legislative priority. They've been fighting for this for a long time. It is the most important policy to be, to be opposing right now because before we can get to the solutions, we have to show that we can stand up to their reckless and dangerous approach. Um, and kind of what's happening in the state level, you know, to, to kind of take this now down a level, is that, you know, we are seeing bills that, that will aim to dismantle the concealed carry system everywhere. I mean, as I said, 12 states have passed it. There's about 26 states where bills are pending. Uh, Indiana, in fact, is, a, is actually an example that I really like in Indiana because Indiana is a place where they try, they're trying to dismantle that concealed carry system. But you know what? They didn't succeed this year. And the session's still open. It's gonna, it's, gonna, it, last it's few <laughs> last few hours. Um, you know, but why didn't they succeed? They didn't succeed because the Indiana Sheriff's Association publicly testified against this policy. The Indiana Police Chief's Association publicly opposed this policy. You have mayors who are saying this is a chaotic and dangerous approach to public safety and we can't have that in our state. You have the polling showing 80% of, of Hoosiers don't want this. And so this Republican dominated legislature has not passed this policy. That's, that's incredible. That, and we're seeing that in lots of places. And we're seeing people stand up for common sense. I mean, in Montana, for the third time in a row, the Montana governor has vetoed permitless carry. And he's a strong Second Amendment supporter. He's a Democrat. And in fact, last year, in 2016, he was attacked for that veto because he vetoed it previously in 2015. And in the year that that you know, President Trump won his election in Montana, well, so did Governor Bullock. And now he's vetoed it again, showing that he knows, he knows what's right for Montana. And that's balancing a respect for the Second Amendment with common sense public safety standards. And it's not just Governor Bullock who's saying this. Again, it's the Montana Sheriff's Association, the Montana Chamber of Commerce. It's the people of Montana who were speaking out and testifying, saying, we don't want this chaotic and dangerous policy. But it's not just Democrats. That's, that's the beauty of this story. It's not just Democrats. South Dakota passed a bill to dismantle their concealed carry system. But you know who stopped it was the Republican governor. And he vetoed it with almost the exact same approach, the exact same language, saying, I respect and believe in the Second Amendment, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have common sense standards. And so kind of we're seeing, you know, there's 12 states that have dismantled their system, and that is what, that is really kind of one of the key elements of why this concealed care reciprocity is so, 
so dangerous, but then we have the other states where we have to fight to protect these systems, stand with law enforcement, stand with our local mayors, our local leaders, to kind of show the state legislators that they can do the right thing, they should do the right thing, they need to do the right thing. Um, because if they don't, you know, where we're gonna end up really, and if you look at all 50 states and kind of where the trends are, where we're gonna end up is a place where there's permitless carry for people who are 18, as young as 18, where you can carry on college campuses or in schools, sporting events, big stadiums, and you will have an enhanced stand your ground protection so that so long as you can claim that you are doing something in self-defense, the burden is now on the prosecutor to prove that you weren't, which is proving a negative, which Adam could tell you is gonna be an incredibly difficult thing and they're actually trying to pass this law in Florida right now. Um, and then that system, which they're trying to build, which is a chaotic and dangerous system, will be imposed on everyone through concealed carry reciprocity. So, you know, I, I actually though, you know, with all of that, I am incredibly confident that we're gonna be able to tell this story and we're gonna be able to work to build the relationships and the allies to get the votes we need to stop this policy. Um, you know, maybe we don't stop it in the House of Representatives, but you know, I think there's, there's a lot of room to make noise and to make sure that you know, there is a, st a strong contingent of opponents who are vocally opposing this. And when we get to the U.S. Senate, we need to make sure that all the senators have heard from their constituents, know these arguments, and are going to vote against this policy. And I think as long as we can get over 40 votes, we'll be able to stop this policy. I'm confident we could do that. I think common sense prevails at the end of the day um, because it starts with the research. It ends with the con it goes to the Constitution. We see the effect in our local communities. And if you tell that story together with the activists, with, with us, right, with us, I mean, that, that's all we, we're all, we're all activists, we're all advocates. If you tell that, so we tell the story, um, and we tell it to our local officials, and we get our friends to do it, and we get our partners to do it, and we get our validators who know it best to do it, you know, I, I think we can get the votes together to win, and, and so that's, uh, you know, that's what makes me optimistic, and that's the job that I get to do every day at every town is, uh, is help our, our, our three and a half million supporters and all of our activists fight these fights in the state houses, fight this fight in Congress, and think about how we are going to um, stop these really dangerous policies. Thanks for your time, and thank you for letting me be on the panel. So I think they're going to activate our mics now so we can have a brief discussion. I know we have to say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. A round of applause for the mayor. <laughs> um, so we're going we're to jump in with a few questions and then move quickly to questions from all of you. Um, with the March on Science about to occur here in D.C. tomorrow, I'd like to begin by asking our panelists about their thoughts on the glaring dearth of research on guns, gun violence, and effective reduction measures, and how we can advance evidence-based science on this critical issue. Shoot. I'll take a crack at that. Um, okay. So uh, many, um, many of you know um, it's widely publicized. President Obama talked about it, um, among others, that the CDC has restrictions as far as its funding uh, research. Um, honestly, it's a not very well understood from a legal term. Uh, the CDC, uh, if Congress appropriated money, they could uh, fund research to answer uh, questions uh, relevant to gun policy. Um, I've actually received some CDC funding to study gun violence, but the, basically the way the policy has worked is they will consider funding gun violence research as long as it's not offensive to the gun lobby. It ultimately is, is sort of how it has played out. Um, so I think that uh, actually, uh, surprisingly, the Department of Justice has done more research, more directly answering policy questions than as CDC. CDC is sort of on thin ice politically compared to Department of Justice and National Institute of Justice. But the big picture really is, even in the, you know, Good old days, or whatever you know, pri prior to um, the, the the Dickey Amendment that uh, placed some restrictions on CDC, there was never high levels of federal funding uh, for one of the most important public health problems. So, uh, a lot of the research that has taken place 
over the past 20 some years um, has been supported by private foundations. So, pri so private foundations, particularly the Joyce Foundation, has played a very prominent role. Um, and sadly, I don't think that's going to change too much any anytime soon. Uh, one, you know, uh, I think Adam mentioned a number of ways that California has been, really been leading the way, uh, but their state legislature. Um, created a special funding stream for a uh, institute to study gun violence and answer some of these gun policies, basically filling the void that the federal government has. So I hope more states will consider that. Well, that's terrific to hear. It's a very similar strategy that they use for tobacco research in California as well, so they're in the vanguard. Um, Rob, you spoke about the issue of reciprocity. reciprocity. Can we also talk about preemption and how the tide has turned on it? Uh, sure. So, the preemption of local communities. Mm -hmm. So, the as Adam pointed out in his presentation, um, one of the trends throughout the 90s was preempting local communities from passing strong and fitting local solutions to gun violence. And, and as Adam said, about 40 states have done that. Um, you know, and where it's been taken now in bills that I'm currently fighting in, in some states, including Tennessee, um, we'll take it a step further and say not only may you not pass a local law that's out of step with federal law, with state law, if you do, you are then eligible for enhanced damages. Now, that they have not had as much success with that because it actually is really galvanizing. Um, local communities to speak out and for mayors to form coalitions. Uh, Mayor Gillum from Tallahassee has formed a wonderful group um, that is kind of informing mayors about how these powers have been taken away from them and how now there's going to be this punitive effect on them. And, and I think we are seeing kind of a more robust discussion around giving power back to local communities to have rules that fit their needs. In particular, one another example I've thought about is in Texas, where after that horrible shooting, there was kind of an enhanced and robust debate about giving Texas cities the ability to do something about open carry. Because at, during the during that shooting, law enforcement found themselves unable to determine who was open carrying legally and then who was the active shooter. And so they have been kind of building a coalition to ask their legislature to return some power to them. That's interesting. Um, last question on, on my end is, um, having spent nearly 15 years of my own career understanding and fighting the tobacco industry playbook, I wonder if our panelists can speak to ways in which the gun industry has adapted that playbook successfully to, um, to protecting uh, their profits and their prerogatives and their wishes and desires. I'll take a, I'll take a, a, a quick crack at that. I mean, I think they may have even done done the uh, one better than the tobacco industry, uh, believe it or not. You know, um, we've heard uh, in a couple of different contexts about the broad immunity laws that the uh, that that Congress and legislatures across the country have given to uh, uh, gun manufacturers, gun retailers, uh, and so in all but the most egregious cases now, it is. Well, I'll say it's exceedingly difficult to hold gun makers or gun sellers accountable, even when they knowingly uh, or, or with a, a wink and a nod allow guns to be sold to folks that they have every reason to believe will uh, traffic them to uh, you know, drug gangs or others uh, who are legally prohibited from doing that. Uh, Rob's former colleagues at the Brady Center have been very effective in holding the, the worst of the worst dealers accountable, and that's really important because it sends the signals to all dealers that they can't just flagrantly violate the law. Uh, but that is uh, uh, only after overcoming these incredible hurdles uh, that uh, legislators uh, at the federal and state level have, have erected uh, to protect uh, the sellers of these products. Um, I, I will draw one other parallel to, to the tobacco context, which is that so many of the uh, important changes that we've seen uh, in both uh, regulation of smoking and, and secondhand smoke and that sort of thing, but also in public behavior, uh, have come out of the litigation that uh, was brought against uh, the tobacco industry. So we've seen, uh, in conjunction with that, a regulatory environment that has uh, 
restricted smoking in public places and, and planes and trains and that sort of thing, uh, we've seen public opinions change dramatically. And a lot of that change uh, was a result of the litigation that uh, both uh, exposed uh, the internal industry documents and industry practices and effectively the knowledge that these companies knew what their product was doing and were deceiving the public about it. Uh, uh, but also then, on the basis of those documents that got obtained in the discovery, you know, led to pictures of tobacco uh, industry executives with their hands in the air in front of Congress, um, uh, misleading Congress and ultimately being forced to acknowledge uh, the truths about their product. Um, again, because of the immunity that the, the gun industry has, bringing the same kind of lawsuits uh, uh, to bring that information out about guns and gun sellers is challenging. Uh, but we have uh, a, a great coalition of, of attorneys of law firms across the country. Uh, Brady, where Rob did such innovative work on uh, gun litigation, is, uh, is still leading the charge. And, and we're working together uh, to try and mobilize the resources uh, and the passion of the private bar uh, to try and do with guns what was done for tobacco. because. Uh, you know, with the, the drumbeat of news from high profile mass shooting to high profile mass shooting to all the mass shootings that none of us could even identify, much less remember, uh, that happened uh, uh, that happened every day across the country. Uh, you know, the legal community, just like the medical community, just like, frankly, the American community, is sick and tired of reading about this every day and is trying to do something. So we're hopeful that we may be able to replicate some of the success yeah. Uh, okay. that you and your colleagues uh, experienced. Sandra, you want to add to that? Yeah, just to add to it from the point of view of the science for a second. Uh, the, uh, Daniel um, made reference to the um, Dickey Amendment and, uh, and really the curtailing of uh, research funds. I mean, that is directly uh, linked to efforts from the gun lobby to um, make sure that federal funding does not flow to research. That has extraordinary implications. In the, the largest implication as far as I'm concerned is that uh, right now, and this is well published, that uh, um, our number of publications per size of a public health problem for firearms is the lowest, together with actually with drowning. Um, but those are two areas where we, we vastly understudy. The NIH uh, funds injuries overall at a much lower rate per burden of injury than anything else. And uh, we, have, we have a missing generation of researchers. The way it works in, uh, in health and in, in, in medicine is that you need funding in order to support the generation of studies and support a generation of researchers. And the, the, the people who have been uh, successful really have done so through being exceptional at uh, finding ways of funding. But there really hasn't been the base of funding support generation of researchers. And the other um, side of it, which I think is directly linked to, um, to special interest efforts, I'm using the term more generally, is uh, the manufacture of doubt. I think the manufacture of doubt about uh, areas of science that are largely straightforward and settled and manufacture of doubt by targeting the work of individual scientists and by targeting things that, uh, that most rational, reasonable scientists um, say we know. And the, the, the public conversation is far away from where the state of the science is. And we've seen this, of course, with tobacco. We've seen this around things like um, global environmental climate change. I mean, these are, these are, these are playbook um, efforts from a particular interest group, again, I'm using that term more generally, um, uh, that uh, has a very particular interest in seeing the science not reveal that their practices are actually harming human health or human well-being. There's no question that if you drive home the, the, the science and it's an, an inconvenient truth, uh, you're guilty of junk science. <laughs> they give you a new label. So that's uh, very interesting. I want to open it up for the audience if there are any questions. I don't know if we have a mic available, Amber, or good we do. So if anyone there has a question, please feel free to jump up. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you. This question is for uh, Dr. Webster. Is there any research being done on because of the increased prevalence of guns in our society and the danger to law enforcement. Uh, that is, uh, you know, I, there may be some existing research out there, but uh, the more guns in our society, the more risk for our law enforcement officers. And uh, yes, uh, suicide is a horrible, terrible problem, but uh, domestic, Domestic violence calls are the most dangerous for our law enforcement officers and 
also the tragedies for the individuals and families uh, involved. And uh, it, maybe that's a way around this funding problem. <laughs> Well, there, there is uh, some research relevant to uh, gun availability uh, and public policies and how that ultimately filters down to risk to law enforcement officers being shot in the line of duty. I, I mentioned a couple of the studies relevant to uh, changes in permit to purchase laws that were fairly dramatic in terms of um, their apparent impact. But there's other research that more broadly uh, shows uh, an association with um, the prev higher prevalence of gun ownership uh, after you control for other factors translates into higher rates of law enforcement officers being shot in the line of duty, which makes sense. We, I mean, you mentioned responding to a domestic encounter, uh, um, um, domestic uh, incident. That is a very common scenario in which law enforcement officers are shot, and it seems, I don't know, my perception is that we're seeing a lot more of those recently. But every time someone, an officer pulls somebody over or stops them on a, on a street, when you have more and more states um, completely deregulating uh, public gun carrying in, 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 in their cars, their exposure is going up. Uh, we had had a decline in law enforcement officers killed on the line of duty that I think correlated a lot with our uh, general decline in crime. but. Uh, the trends are starting to go up along with our gun homicide trends uh, for more officers shot in line of duty. So it's something we should be very attuned to, and they're, they're also obviously very relevant, as we've already mentioned, I believe, in, in an advocacy standpoint, um, for completely deregulation of guns represents an uh, important threat to those who try to protect us uh, every day. Um, let's go first to you and then to you, my friend. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, this is for the doctor from uh, Boston. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. <laughs> uh, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the burden that comes into the healthcare system uh, from those that survive gun violence. Could you, you I, I make a presumption that a lot of that will be on Medicaid, uh, but could you uh, ex, you know, exposit on the yeah. on that whole burden issue. Yeah, there's a there's a combination um, um, of um, yeah, certainly Medicaid and also people who are uninsured. Um, uh, the the, the, the list scientific literature on this is actually relatively thin, and um, it's now emerging. And this is part of this is this is some of the more obvious questions that we haven't actually tackled in a systematic way, just because there's been a paucity of research. But um, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm asked the question of if there were to be an influx of money, what's the one thing, what's the one study that actually you would do? And from an epidemiologic point of view, I think the one study that needs to be done is actually a, um, a cohort study. It's a, it's a registry of people who are victims of gun violence. And we, we do these registries all the time. We do registries with cancer survivors, registries with uh, people who survive uh, traumatic events. But uh, there, there's a whole range of questions about the full burden of the scope of gun injury that we don't know. One of the areas which I've done a fair bit of work about, for example, is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and mental illness. And uh, the range of the, the societal burden um, from, a, from a health point of view, from a disability point of view, from a cost point of view of mental illness around traumatic events is almost certainly larger than the trauma itself. At a very dark side, just to be clear, when someone's dead, they don't cost us anything. So just to be very clear, but when you have injuries, right, um, you have the people injured, you have their hospitalization costs, their return hospitalization costs, their complications, their mental illness, as well as the mental illness of people around them from a traumatic point of view. So, you know, one could do one could guess what this is based on evidence from other areas, but we shouldn't be guessing on something that is as as important an area of public health impact as this as this is, as Professor Webster said. Down here, we have another question. <laughs> Just let me add. I, I know in California that there is victims counseling that's provided either by the county or the state. Um, would you be able to get sort of? Uh, um, data from that kind of thing. I don't know if that exists in other states. I don't, I don't know if it exists. Uh, well, there, um, I think most states have um, programs to assist crime victims. 
there's sort of a pipeline for federal money that goes to states and then ultimately to localities. Um, honestly, I don't think that that has been examined to the degree that it should. Uh, I, I don't think that there's anything a, akin to a registry type process, though. Um, but I, I strongly suspect that the victims of gun violence have underutilized that set of resources, uh, and it's something that should be explored more. And then we have one more question down here, unless we have anything else. I think we have two more down here then. Okay. <laughs> this gentleman was first. Thank you, Amber. Um, this is a question probably best addressed to Rob, but to the extent the others want to comment, that's fine. Uh, the mayor mentioned something about the, uh, uh, the support that they got from, uh, I think, police, I don't know if that's police unions or police uh, chiefs uh, in uh, pr pr trying to promote and support common sense gun legislation and how that was instrumental in Indiana. Uh, and throughout the presentations, I, I thought that was something that I, I haven't heard that much before and seem, seems to me that this is a group of uh, people in our society who could have a tremendous influence if they came out in favor of common sense uh, uh, gun safety laws. And mm -hmm. I guess could you, Rob, or somebody else comment on are they as active as they could be or, you know, is, are there reasons why they, they can't be as active as uh, more active or why don't we hear about this, I guess, is why don't I have, uh, I don't know, you don't, you don't know my particular situations, but I think I'm fairly attuned to what's happening and this is not something that I've heard about. That's a great question. Um, I, I think law enforcement is actively engaged, and I think it is the responsibility of advocacy organizations to help lift up their voices. Um, you see kind of every major national law enforcement association be in support of things like background checks and come out against policies like concealed carry reciprocity. Um, at the state level, you see incredibly, I mentioned a couple examples, but I, I think about Alabama, in fact, which doesn't have the strongest concealed carry system, right? The only element of their system is that sheriffs who issue the permits get discretion over who can get a permit if a person is a risk of themselves or others. <coughs> and right now, the, there's a bill pending to dismantle the system. And the sheriffs, if you were lived in Alabama, you would see it all, all, everywhere. I mean, the clips that I see coming out of Alabama were overwhelming of the sheriffs on their local television, in their local papers, talking about the issue. And so, I think in the states where these fights are ongoing, you see more public law enforcement, but it is the job and it's something I think about all the time of how to elevate those voices so that they, they permeate and so that we see them as messengers and that we are also there to support their voices because it's gonna take both. Law enforcement on their own is not strong enough to stand up to the gun lobby. The gun lobby, is, they are aggressively and affirmatively attacking law enforcement in Alabama. Um, and so it is kind of the job of advocates to an activist to stand with them and say, this makes sense, I support this, and, and make sure their legislators hear that. Can I just make one point on, on this factor? Uh, so um, the um, police chiefs uniformly very, very strong supporter, uh, support for uh, stronger gun laws. Um, they're, they're, you cannot always count on the support from the FOP uh, for some of these measures. And my own view is that it's sort of more a cultural component, sort of a blue collar, white collar thing. I think one of the biggest things we face to advance more effective uh, approaches to reducing gun violence is that the gun lobby does a masterful job of making this purely a cultural conversation. And so, do you like guns or do you not like guns kind of thing, rather than getting into the specifics of what does it actually mean for reciprocity? What does it actually mean for background checks? And I think a lot of the FOP are very responsive to this cultural debate, and the so-called anti-gun rhetoric doesn't appeal to them. So um, it's, it's more of a challenge I think when you get to, uh, to unions, police unions, then police leaders, police leaders uh, also, frankly, they are the ones who are held accountable. When, when if Baltimore's murder rate goes up, it's the police commissioner who's on the hot seat. 
And so he has a lot invested in keeping violence low, not only for his officers, but for his community. Um, so that's why I think they are very, um, very astute and, and, you know, ready to be effective. Thank you so much. And sadly, I've been given the high sign that we have to stop, but uh, the speakers are here. And if a few of you want to come down and ask a few questions, that's great. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to our online audience. And thank you, of course, to this fabulous panel.